Okay, let's start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning in Jakarta. Uh, today we will have uh, our uh, next uh, webinar series on COVID-19. And this is uh, today we are going to talk about jobs and the pandemic in Indonesia. We already have three uh, prominent speakers uh, in the panel. Uh, so we have uh, uh, Chris Manning, uh, Titi Anas, and uh, Joanna Octavia to talk about uh, this issue. And uh, Chris Manning, uh, Honorary Associate Professor of ANU, will lead and will chair the, the event. So uh, I will uh, let Pak Chris to introduce the speakers and probably to give some uh, overview of the issue and then uh, chair the whole session. Silakan Pak Chris. Thank you very much, Pak Ajo. Uh, Selamat siang uh, in Jakarta. Uh, sorry, in Canberra, and Selamat pagi in 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 uh, Jakarta and elsewhere in Indonesia. Um, it's uh, welcome to this uh, Indonesia project uh, seminar series on jobs in the pandemic. Um, we have two speakers today. Uh, so the speakers. I'm not a speaker. I'm just uh, the chairman. Uh, the two speakers are Titik Anas, Dr. Titik Anas and, and Joanna Octavia. Uh, and they, go, they are going to address the webinar. Before I introduce them, uh, let me make a couple of comments about the situation of jobs in Indonesia uh, as, as I see it right now. First of all, how best might we characterize the situation? Um, Unfortunately, there are no silver, silver bullets, such as unemployment or underemployment, to guide us uh, in the middle of uh, uh, 2020. Indonesia only undertakes a labour force survey in February, and uh, that was really before COVID had hit Indonesia. Um, and the second survey of, in the year is in August, and those results don't come out until November. Um, so at this stage, we are very much in the dark when it comes to the national picture. But it is very clear that many jobs have been lost, at least for the present. Despite some new opportunities, for example, personal protective equipment, we can be fairly certain that the net number of jobs lost is negative, at least for the current quarter. And the negative impact is almost certainly much larger if we take into account the fallen hours worked, the number of people that have been dirumakan, that have been stood down, uh, and associated loss of incomes. For example, I, I think uh, Titic, uh, Dr. Titic will present some data which suggests that manufacturing jobs have been particularly hard hit. What do we know? about uh, the situation. From media reports, we've got a fairly good idea that many large companies have laid off workers. HBSC, thousands of workers. Um, uh, Hilton, over 2,000. Gruder has offered 400 workers uh, early retirement and stood down 800. And so the list goes on. But we need to keep in mind that most people who have lost work and incomes are almost certainly from micro and small enterprises. Unique to this crisis, the effect of cutbacks on labour demand has been exacerbated by the directive that people work and study from home and by the regulation of social distancing, the PSBB. For example, in the case of Job Jakarta, where I reside, a myriad of informal sector workers of a range of services, food, transport and delivery, consumables, have at least temporarily put their businesses on hold. Not only has the flow of tourists dried up, but hundreds of tens of thousands of students have left Job Jakarta to study at home and will continue to do, many of them will do, continue to do so till the end of 2020. 
I think Joanna will provide some more detailed information about the loss of informal sector jobs that have been associated with similar regulation of places of work and study. I hope that the discussion will reveal information on trends in the job situation by region. The restrictions on mobility initially impacted especially in Jakarta and the cities in Java. Affecting demand for urban services and on work and in crowded places such as traditional markets. Most of you will have seen pictures of the crowded Pasar that seem to have little hope of following the social distancing or PSBB rules. Unlike two decades ago, at the time of the Asian financial crisis, I think it's reasonable to say that people are less able to substitute formal with informal jobs this time around. But at the same time, as the concentration of effects in the large cities, the impacts of COVID have now spread by uh, industry and region. And you, we can see the, the large number of uh, cases uh, in outer island provinces, such as South Sumatra, South Sulawesi, uh, even uh, Papua. Um, and so we'd expect then the employment effects, uh, the effects on jobs to have spread also well beyond the major cities on Java. Finally, it's worth remembering that the job situation is a moving target from week to week and from uh, month to month uh, as the virus uh, unfolds across Indonesia. Regulations and economic conditions are changing both in Jakarta and in the regions. Jakarta, for example, has had two extensions of social distancing regulations in July alone. So this is very much an unfolding story. So those are my few opening comments. I hope they will help, help us uh, think about the topic in general. Now to the, our two speakers, uh, Dr. Tijanas will go first. And she is a special advisor to the Ministry of Finance and a senior lecturer and researcher at the Department of Economics at Jairan University. Dr. Anas earned her bachelor degree from the University of Indonesia and her master's and PhD degrees from the Australian National University. We are all in Canberra. Besides advising the government, she is also a very active researcher. And her interests cover areas such as international trade, macroeconomics, industrial organisation, investment policy, and small scale business development. And she continues to published widely in those fields. Our second speaker is Joanna Octavia, and she's a PhD candidate at the University of Warwick, uh, the University of Warwick Institute of Employment Research. She is currently um, uh, spending time at CSIS in Jakarta. She has a master, uh, a PhD, sorry, she has a Master of Science from the London School of Economics uh, and a Bachelor of Arts uh, from the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. The main areas of interest are the informal sector, women's voice, industrial relations in the platform economy, and she, her areas of study have mostly been in the area of political economy. She spent the last six years in, in Jakarta uh, CSIS as a visiting fellow. Um, she's worked at UBA, Indonesia. She has extensive practical experience with supporting the informal sector uh, and the Centre for Public Policy uh, Transformation in Jakarta. Um, while in Jakarta, she's been very active writing and speaking about the informal sector topics like mobilization of online motorcycle taxi drivers, organizing and mobilizing informal workers in the, in the digital age, and on social networks and collective action, the gig economy and, in Indonesia and so on. So she's uh, very, very well uh, uh, 
quick to talk about the informal system and, and, and the pandemic. So those are my uh, opening comments and my introduction to the two speakers. So it's over to Titi to uh, give the first address. Uh, thank you, Pakris. Uh, uh, how is my voice? Is it clearly? Uh, yeah. Uh, good, uh, good morning uh, to uh, friends in uh, Indonesia. Uh, good afternoon uh, for uh, participants in uh, Canberra in Australia. And good evening to Puspa and everyone else in the other side of the world. Uh, thank you very much for the Indonesia project for this opportunity to share uh, how, how Indonesia's government responding to the uh, COVID-19, particularly uh, for this uh, for today's topic on uh, workers. Uh, my uh, talk will comprise of three parts. First is how uh, COVID-19 affecting uh, uh, businesses and jobs in Indonesia. The second part is on how the government policy uh, dealing uh, with uh, COVID-19, par particularly on uh, business uh, and uh, workers. Uh, the third uh, part is I will touch a, a, a little bit on the, mon uh, the monitoring and evaluation part of the policy implementation. Uh, and I will listen to Joanna later on, an expert uh, here uh, who cares about Indonesia so that we can improve any policies that still uh, uh, considered probably not effective or not well targeted. So let me start with what pa uh, Chris already uh, mentioned. Uh, first slide, please. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay. Just like what pa Chris mentioned, we are still uh, uh, struggling with COVID-19 as the number of cases still continue to increase. Although as uh, you probably attended the CSIS um, webinar launch of the uh, dash COVID-19 dashboard suggesting that uh, the, the, uh, the active case is uh, declining Although uh, in, the, uh, in the last few days, we see some increase also in the uh, active cases. With this, um, uh, re the, the increase is, pro uh, is partly resulted uh, from the opening up of the economy. I mean, in, uh, it's <coughs> uh, <coughs> taking in place uh, um, after the opening up of the, uh, the economy. And <coughs> although the, uh, and also the, the, the more or increase in uh, testing and tracing uh, that uh, carried out by uh, the uh, government and the health sectors. The the increase in uh, the number of uh, the the the, the COVID nineteen itself affecting the economy for sure. If we see or projected the economy to grow to five point three this year, when we did a, a forecast last year, we don't see it anymore. Um, we have been revising the, the projection twice. It is going to be difficult to um, make an accurate uh, projection uh, given that the situation is very dynamic, that the COVID-19 is um, unpredictable, uh, the effect on the, uh, the economy. But uh, given our uh, second uh, projection, the economy might grow uh, only 1% this year or if the worst come worse, uh, the, the economy might be contracted to a 0.4%. Uh, other uh, international uh, institutions also uh, make a projection on the economic growth of Indonesia. And the latest uh, projection is also revised downward, like the ADB forecasted um, minus 1%. IMF minus 0.3%, the World Bank uh, uh, projected the Indonesian economy is going to be stagnated and the OECD uh, uh, from uh, minus 2.8% to uh, minus 3.9%. The slowdown of the economic growth is for sure going to be affected the social welfare uh, as well. We, are, we, we projected or uh, predicted the, the unemployment is going to increase and the poverty rate is going to increase. 
For that, of course, the government has to undertake a policy to mitigate or to minimize the negative effect to the social uh, welfare. Next slide, please. The early shock to the economy of the COVID-19 we have witnessed in the first quarter of 2020, uh, where the uh, economic growth was only 2.97%. From the demand side, we see the, 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 the reduction of growth in all parts of the, uh, the expenditure. On the supply side, also most, almost all sectors show the much lower growth, um, particularly uh, uh, the slowing down uh, um, significant in transportation, accommodation and food beverages, manufacturing and trade. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some studies by uh, research institutions and consultants also provided uh, the um, a projection that the economy, the sectors in, in the economy will uh, hardly hit. For example, on the second, uh, on the right hand side of the table, we see that the earnings of the tourism industry will decline very sharply and followed by uh, the uh, trade sectors and the manufacturing. The hit is come, has, uh, comes from not only the, uh, the, the supply side, but also the, the demand side. Next slide, please. How the effect of the slowdown of the uh, economic activity um, resulted by uh, COVID-19 containment are uh, two jobs. Uh, as pa Chris mentioned, we only have labor force survey twice a year and has not come out yet after the COVID-19 hit Indonesia. But some early survey like the, the World Bank uh, high frequency household monitoring uh, survey um, can make a suggestion that uh, many Indonesian have already affected by uh, COVID-19. These surveys are, uh, is going to be uh, conducted for, for times at least, for rounds at least. The first round is in May. So this is the result of the May uh, survey suggesting that one third of uh, uh, who works in the manufacturing, construction and transport stop working. And the share of people who stop working are at the same across the welfare distribution. And those in Java, especially in Jakarta and the urban areas, people with senior secondary education and lower are likely to stop working. And no, no, not much different between female and male breadwinners. So this early survey suggested that yes, we are having an issue of uh, jobs in Indonesia. Uh, next, please. Then, given that uh, a policy response, um, ever since uh, the early the, the beginning of this year, the government have has responded to uh, the, the 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 COVID nineteen. Uh, given the dynamics of uh, the, the the evolution of the the the, the problems, uh, as you probably as some of you probably uh, already uh, also monitor that the first was addressing the, the disruption of the supply chain in February and the reduction in tourism uh, visits in Indonesia. But then as COVID-19 um, uh, 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 contagion spread across the, the nation, particularly the, the urban areas and the Jakarta greater area at the beginning, this response has been uh, changed or um, revised or updated to uh, meet the, 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 the evolving situation. So uh, currently what, have, what the government has done is first upsizing the social assistance. We Indone in Indonesia have already established uh, the uh, social assistance program so uh, based on that uh, already existing system, the, the government upsized the size and the coverage. The second one is on fiscal incentive to address the, the, the formal workers who are still working, the, those with income 
of 200 million rupiah a year is uh, tax free and not uh, paying taxes. Um, and these taxes are usually paid uh, by the, 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 the employers monthly. So uh, monthly they, the, the workers uh, are um, receiving the benefit. And the third is the Prakerja program. Uh, the government also have the cash for works, uh, basically providing jobs to those uh, who are not working and uh, get uh, paid for the work. And the last one is the help, uh, the, um, uh, help for the companies, including the micro, uh, small and medium enterprises. Next. Uh, as you probably know that the, the Indonesian government uh, have the PKH, the uh, Family Hope Programs, and the uh, non-cash food assistance, the Kartu Sembako, um, and also Dana Desa. The government has been uh, optimizing on these um, um, uh, instruments, again, addressing uh, the most vulnerable uh, income groups in Indonesia. On top of what the government, the central government doing, the local government also provided or addressing the social uh, welfare uh, as the uh, first uh, instrument or for foremost in instrument. For example, the local, uh, the, the West Java government where I live uh, covers uh, more than 10 million uh, of the 14 million family in West Java through the additional support uh, to the uh, the central uh, to the central government budget. So in total, they cover uh, sixty to seventy percent of the uh, population. Next, this slide is rather messy, but uh, these are the seven programs uh, of social assistance that the government of Indonesia is having. The first, the left. Uh, and the left hand side, the blue one is the PKH, the Family Hope Program. Uh, the, the, the upsize is on the uh, value of the assistance. Um, this covered the bottom 20% of Indonesians, um, the bottom uh, um, income group uh, of Indonesia. And then we have the non cash transfer, uh, we call it Kartu Sembako. This is non-cash, so every uh, every recipient has its uh, account uh, in the financial sectors. The size is the amount is upsize uh, from one hundred fifty thousand to two hundred uh, two hundred thousand, and the beneficiary is also upsize from fifteen point four million to twenty million. And uh, the purple one is on the electricity bill discount. So basically the government pay the bill of the, uh, um, the, uh, the electricity uh, customer of 450 uh, volt, um, um, uh, the, 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 the smallest, the smallest um, consumers in the electricity consumption. Uh, it's around 24 million household. Uh, the government pay their bill for, for until the end of December. Yeah, so uh, it, it, the program has been expanded. It's no longer April to September, but until the end of the, the year. And the, the government also uh, subsidized the 900 uh, VA customers, around 7.2 million household and it's also expanded into december and the government is also planning to add more of the recipients of the 900 va um, in the next few months and the additional program is the uh, jabodetabek the jakarta greater area uh, assistance because jakarta uh, greater area is the first hit uh, area uh, of the COVID-19 is and the hardest hit. So particular assistance is provided uh, uh, for the uh, uh, people in the uh, Jakarta greater area. 
Similarly to urban areas in uh, outside the Jakarta uh, greater area also provided uh, with cash, uh, additional cash uh, social assistance. This is cash basically. And the uh, amount uh, or the uh, support will be provided until December. So with uh, the other one is uh, the uh, village fund is converted into social assistance. This supposedly cover all the vulnerable group in the villages who is not covered by program family hope or kartu sembako or additional cash assistance uh, that already provided by the government. So with this all scheme, we hope to cover the lowest 50% of the income group. And uh, we also have another uh, scheme which is called Prakerja, which I will talk uh, more a bit later. To those who are not currently in a formal education, has no work or they're from the MSMB. This program is a adjusted program that should be should also have been implemented this year but because of the COVID, the mechanism and the uh, way of uh, deliverables is uh, adjusted a little bit maybe i should uh, speed up a little bit ne next slide please and this is distribution of the social assistance beneficiaries um, the, the largest beneficiaries are the farmers uh, and um, if we see uh, the sectors and the, the income group, uh, among the income group, uh, I, the, the farmers are the, the, the largest recipient, followed by uh, the services sectors, people who work in the services sectors, um, uh, and, the manu and the manufacturing. Next. And how the disbursement of the social assistance so far, among the budget allocated, like the 995 uh, trillion, 203 trillion is allocated to social assistance. So far, it's already disbursed like 38% of uh, the uh, budget allocated. The, the, the existing program are usually uh, more smooth in, uh, in uh, disbursement, while the new or the top up is uh, less, uh, less um uh smooth than the uh, already uh, established program next uh this is what i talk about the uh formal workers um uh, take home pay they got higher take home pay because the government paid their uh, taxes the claims are so far uh, around 1.1 trillion rupiah uh with beneficiary of 108 and the uh, uh, sectors who claim the largest is the trade sectors, uh, the, the most affected uh, sectors uh, in, in the economy, followed by the manufacturing and construction. Next. And the third is the Prakerja program. The early design is to, uh, to upgrade the skill of the workers with the beneficiary of 2 million. Bef because of the, the because of the COVID-19, the number of beneficiary increased, the budget allocated is increased, and the design is not only for skill improvement, but also to maintain the purchasing power of uh, workers who have been laid off um, uh, or being um, working at home, for example. And um, the, the, the benefit, benefit is also uh, adjusted while in the original program the, the the training can be online offline and hybrid with the value of the training is from three to seven million with the uh, incentive is only like 500 a month one month it's only one time and incentive to do to conduct or to uh, to uh, give pro, uh, feedback to the survey uh, because of the COVID 19 the training uh, is has been um, uh, adjusted uh, with the value of the training, uh, only one million, it's only um, uh, online, and the benefit uh, to the recipient is uh, 600,000 a month for four months. And the first three batches of the uh, Prakerja has been um, highly subscribed. 
11.6 million applied uh, at the Prakerja website with the simple, uh, um, um, what is it, selection process, um, only verify, you only have to provide the electronic uh, ID and the phone number and also the, um, uh, uh, and uh, only those uh, two actually. And the verification is by checking the ID and the phone number and also face recognition and the, whether the email is correct or not. And the beneficiary, of course, because of the uh, over subscri subscription, the beneficiary is only uh, like 680. 58% of them are the layoff workers. 35% uh, is job seekers, but also some uh, inclusion error where 6% are employee actually. And 1% is from uh, micro uh, uh, um, uh, business. Um, the among these recipients, some of them are the white list uh, of the Ministry of um, Manpower and the um, employee um, social security uh, members. Next, this is the distribution of the recipient where, where where we can see that almost all I think all the the provinces uh, have the participants uh, of uh, prakerja program where the uh, the highest uh, participants come from the most affected uh, region of the COVID-19, which is Jakarta, West Java, um, uh, and then uh, East Java, uh, Central Java, and Banten. Next. And from the uh, incentive, uh, it's already claimed uh, for uh, 641 billion. And the interesting thing is that it's not only through the conventional uh, financial sectors like the bank, but mainly uh, spend or uh, disburse through the um, e-wallet, yeah, like the OFO, for even the largest is through OFO, followed by GoPay and uh, Ling, Ling Aja. The use of the uh, incentives by the recipients is to purchase fuel, electric to pay electricity, um, uh, purchase mobile phone credit, uh, spending on the mini market, or withdrawn. Uh, Thirty percent of the participants has zero balance in their account. Sixty percent has less than fifty percent, uh, fifty thousand. The training package chosen by the participants, the highest is the marketing skills and IT, finance, uh, foreign language, uh, lifestyle, management, office, uh, social behavior, food and beverages. Next. The uh, Prakerja uh, program has been uh, in public attention, highly critical uh, size, uh, so that uh, the government uh, uh, the Prakerja committee uh, particularly had met their evalu evaluation. So uh, the program has been, uh, held, uh, have been um, uh, stopped temporarily. And because uh, the, re the, the review has to be made and the uh, adjustment has to be made to the decree, uh, because in Indonesia, everything has to have to have a decree. If you have to change uh, one element in the decree, you have to change the decree itself. So it will take time uh, to, um, to uh, restart uh, a program. One important clause in the um, amendment of the decree is that the incentive money must be returned if the participant doesn't fit the criteria. And the implementation of the offline training uh, will is planned to start in August. And given the, the budget allocated of 20 trillion, the quota for the training should be increased to uh, 500 a batch, 500,000 a batch to uh, allow the, the, the budget allocated uh, be uh, absorbed. Next. Uh, cash for work, basically providing jobs to uh, people uh, through the Ministry of Public Works, uh, Agriculture, uh, Forestry, uh, 
fishery, and also local governments. Many local governments in Indonesia provide this cash for works. And even Dana Desa uh, will also be converted to cash for works. Next. Um, apart from uh, those uh, uh, instruments, the government also provide private sectors, particularly MSMEs, uh, with support. The first one is the subsidized credit interest payment for MSMEs. Um, the uh, program is basically um, uh, for all the credits in the, the, the financial institution, the, the interest will be paid by the government. Uh, the government uh, require uh, those uh, credit uh, below 500 million rupiah to be doesn't have to be restructured to get the facility but the credit uh, over 500 million needs to be restructured and the collectability uh, uh, quality is um, is um, made and the government also provide low-cost working capitals for MSMEs. This is through the placement of government uh, funding to the financial sectors, particularly the banking sectors. Uh, and then the government also provide the, uh, the uh, insurance, um, uh, the, the, the credit guarantee uh, to the um, to the uh, loans that provided by the, uh, the financial sectors, particularly the banking sectors, uh, so that the, uh, the take up is more because uh, the COVID-19 um, pose higher risk to the banking sectors to lend uh, capitals to anyone. And then loan restructured for MSME uh, based on the OJ OJK uh, data, we already uh, have 5 million MSMEs. Uh, the loans has been restructured. Value of uh, the uh, loans of uh, 300, more than 300 trillion. And also, uh, if you see the, from the news, um, um, uh, from the news that you also uh, uh, hear that the president wants to give uh, cash transfer to productive use uh, and also the uh, credit for the uh, household um, household uh, uh, businesses and the last one is uh, the tax refunds for the MSMEs. Uh, this is only for those reg registered in the tax office basically. Next. So, um, I think uh, the government is taking the, the stand where the uh, a responsive uh, and effective policy requires regular, regular monitoring. We at the Ministry of Finance also uh, have a MONEF team to, um, to monitor and evaluate the implementation of the, um, uh, the, 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 the COVID-19, um, the fund allocated to COVID-19 uh, handling and the economic re recovery uh, in general. Uh, basically, the objective is to assess whether the programs meet the, meet the objective and the implementation is as planned. Uh, part of the task is the, the, the bottlenecking and making adjustment to policy for better target, targeting and impactful. And you also probably uh, hear that the, the president also established a team of um, this economic recovery uh, program. So I think I end my... Uh, my introduction uh, introduction to the, our discussion uh, there and thank you very much once again uh, for the uh, opportunity thank, thank you very much Pajiti. can you hear me yeah uh, thank, thank, thank you very much that's that, that's a that's a very comprehensive uh, introduction to to what the government is doing a uh, wide array of, of, of programs. Um, uh, the, the, the ability to mount the programs is certainly impressive compared with, uh, 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 say, 1998, uh, because Indonesia's really gone into social assistance in quite a big way. Uh, so uh, so uh, that's, that's very good. I guess the question we'd have for this topic, uh, jobs, is how much is getting to people who have lost their, lost their jobs? And uh, maybe uh, Joanna will ask later on uh, uh, how much is getting down to the informal sector. Uh, so can I ask Joanna now to uh, uh, address uh, the topic that is uh, stories from the informal sector. Salakandma.
Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Pat Chris, uh, for welcoming me. And also, thank you so much for the invitation from the ANU Indonesia project to attend the uh, panel today. And also, thank you to Utite for the very comprehensive explanation about the government policy responses earlier. Um, today, I'll be sharing a bit, uh, a bit about the jobs and pandemic, the case of Indonesia, but uh, on stories and perspectives from the informal sector. The presentation uh, will be divided uh, into three parts. The first part, I'll be discussing a bit about the overview of the COVID-19 in Indonesia, um, what the major aspects of the response uh, are that affects the state of informality in the country. Also talk a bit about um, the state of informality in Indonesia, especially setting the scene of what the informal sector was like when COVID-19 broke out uh, in the country. I'll also talk a bit about the impact on informal sector workers and uh, as well as the uh, impact on certain types of occupations across geographies in the country. Part two, we'll talk uh, a bit about the response, uh, not only by government, but also other stakeholders, such as civil society, NGO, private sector, among the workers themselves, and the implications that uh, these responses may have uh, raised uh, with regards to impacts on the informal sector. And in the last part, we'll discuss a bit about future direction and also some short-term as well as long-term policy recommendations. Um, so for an overview of COVID-19 outbreak in Indonesia, I think uh, Butite had explained a bit earlier as well. Uh, the first case broke out in early March this year, followed soon thereafter with uh, calls to close offices, schools, public places, um, travel ban uh, was set in place and also large-scale social restrictions were put in place starting in Jakarta but soon spreading into other, other parts of the country in, including uh, Surabaya, Bodetabek regions and etc. Uh, I think of notable um, of, of note uh, during this period uh, the past five months is also the homecoming ban uh, during the Ramadan month which uh, basically uh, uh, prohibits uh, number of uh, workers from going home to their hometowns. Um, in early June, we saw the gradual reopening of office, offices, businesses, activities with limited capacities. Uh, but unfortunately, um, uh, the, the, uh, the COVID crisis is still ongoing. Uh, I think as of this week, we are at 100,000 confirmed cases and the slope is still going upwards. Um, the COVID-19 can be characterized by uh, three, three major things, and these are things that affect the livelihoods of the informal sector. The first is restrictions on mobility. Um, the second is closure of space and activities. And the third is consumer behavioral change, and we'll be seeing these patterns, uh, these themes and patterns um, throughout the presentation as uh, we discuss the impact of the pandemic on the informal sector workers. Uh, just an overview of informality, um, the majority of Indonesians do um, generate their income, uh, earn their livelihoods in the informal sector. More than 55% of the workforce uh, work in the informal sector. Uh, they are spread across sectors on occupations in both the rural as well as urban areas. Um, you have informal sector workers in uh, agriculture, fisheries, domestic work, construction, uh, transport work, just to name a few. Um, the majority of informal workers can be divided into uh, two categories. The first is wage employment, in which they, um, they generate income, uh, they receive salary from a dedicated employer, or self-employment, uh, in which they are own account workers and they, uh, they get their income on a per task basis. Informal workers also access work in various ways. As discussed earlier, they could be um, salaried by one particular employer. They could also come in for the day and get paid for that day's worth of work, or they could also access work on a per task basis. For example, like online motorcycle taxi drivers getting orders um, and getting paid for every order. Uh, and I think a, a notable part of the informal sector, uh, which affects the, um, the implications of the responses that we'll discuss later on, is the fact that they are very, uh, the workers are very heterogeneous. Um, not everyone who is work uh, who is poor work in the informal sector, and not everyone who worked in the informal sector uh, are poor. Uh, although there is in developing countries there is a there is there is a relationship between the two. 
Um, just to set the scene, uh, when the COVID-19 broke out, uh, informal sector in Indonesia is a mix between traditional forms of work and new forms of work. Uh, in the recent years, with the help of technology, as well as the penetration of smartphones and internet connection, uh, new ways of working have emerged. Um, this does not only transform old industries, for example, uh, OJEX, uh, motorcycle taxis, have existed in Indonesia for many, many years. Uh, but it was only recently through the use of a smartphone app, such as Gojek, that consumers and um, drivers can be connected seamlessly. But it has also, um, technology has also created new, new types of work that didn't exist before. Uh, for example, a kudo agent uh, uh, could facilitate online transactions for customers who do not yet have smartphones um, and take commissions based on the sales that they generate uh, using this platform. Uh, to accommodate these uh, the informal workers, uh, it is also worth noting that in 2015, the uh, both agencies for uh, workers' welfare and health have also launched the non-employee scheme, uh, which protects against um, against sickness, uh, death, and as well as old age, uh, which informal workers can pay for uh, independently. However, uh, it's also worth noting that this coverage does not uh, cover the loss of income, well, which many informal workers are experiencing uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, as of the COVID-19 outbreak, the informal workers are not yet recognized by the law and manpower. The law and manpower recognizes workers as those who possess formal working relationship with a particular employer. Uh, the law unfor unfortunately also does not um, recognize own account workers or self-employed workers. Um, as such, informal workers um, are unregulated, their work is unregistered, uh, and they are also unprotected by, the, by a dedicated social safety net during this crisis. Uh, this, uh, the next few slides I'll be talking a bit about the general impact on informal sector workers for, uh, across sectors. So for informal, circle, uh, sec, uh, for informal workers who continue to work, um, first, they do have a, a difficulty in accessing markets. Uh, many informal workers, especially in the urban spaces, uh, they, they work in public space. So I think the image of street vendors come to mind. And with the closure of certain public places, they are unable to access places where they normally would generate their income from. Uh, with mobility restrictions, there uh, there were also increasing costs uh, related to transport. Um, they have to depend on their own transportation uh, to get to work. Um, at the start of the pandemic uh, outbreak response, um, there wasn't a movement to provide uh, PPEs for free yet, for example, like masks or other protective equipment. So most of these costs had to be borne by the workers themselves. Uh, there was also a drop in demand. Uh, it, it is, I, I think it's worth noting that um, informal sector is often an extension of the formal sector. Uh, for example, when I was, when I was working in Jakarta, I, I remember uh, sometimes I and my colleagues and other people in the office building would buy food from the street vendors hanging out outside of the office building. And I think that that is one way, uh, you know, one way where there is a relationship, close relationship between formal sector operations and informal sector operations. Um, there's also um, stories being shared by transport workers that uh, when schools were closed and children were not going to school, they also lose that bit of uh, income uh, or langanan that they, they normally have uh, because they used to ferry uh, students to school. Um, there's also a drop in trade and service sectors with, uh, I think, economic, uh, economic difficulties uh, affecting uh, everyone, not just informal sector workers. There is, uh, there is a change in consumption behaviors because of that. Um, and as a result, there is a, there is a, a drop in uh, the demand for their services and products as well. Um, with uh, given that COVID-19 is a health crisis as well, uh, there is understandably a drop in demand for services such as massage or cleaning services. Um, this also affects the income that uh, certain types of informal workers uh, are used to generating. Uh, finally, uh, it is uh, 
worth noting that the informal sector is a dependent ecosystem within itself. Often the consumer of informal uh, trade and services are the informal workers themselves. And the drop in their, uh, in their income could affect uh, their consumption of other services within the ecosystem. As for informal sec uh, workers who are not working, uh, we are hearing stories of termination of employment. Uh, there are a number of stories of this happening, especially for domestic workers who, uh, who are being told not to come back to work. Um, given that they have no formal working arrangements with their employers, there is no obligation for employers to give prior notice nor severance pay. Uh, and, that, uh, yeah, and this is affecting uh, quite a number of workers across sectors. Uh, finally, just before the uh, migration ban was implemented, we, we did see reports of uh, informal workers who are losing jobs or who are not uh, generating enough income to live in cities heading back to their hometown. As for shared impact, these are uh, felt by informal workers uh, sector workers across uh, sectors and not just self-employed or uh, wage employed workers. Uh, they do face uh, economic vulnerability. Uh, uh, a majority of them do uh, face mounting debt. Uh, I think we do have a credit culture in Indonesia where um, things are often bought on credit, not just, um, not just assets such as automobile products, but also things like smartphones, for example. Um, there are reports that informal workers also face difficulties in paying school fees for their children. Um, they also face uh, food insecurity. Uh, there, is, there is a quote that you know, goes around whenever we talk about informal sector and the COVID impact on them is that uh, hunger may kill us before coronavirus does. And this ties into the second point, which is that there's often an economic and health trade-off uh, in which um, there is a trade-off between doing social distancing versus the need to actually go out and work and generate income because many informal workers do li live on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, overcrowded living conditions also create a health risk uh, for many of them, uh, especially those who cannot do social distancing and are exposed to um, unfavorable uh, health risks as a result. Uh, care work this predominantly affects female informal workers. As schools were closed, uh, students were told to study from home, uh, and this creates a double burden for, uh, for workers who have to work outside of their homes and to care for their children inside of their homes. Um, there is rising expenses in education. Um, some schools require the use of smartphones in order for students to study effectively from home. Uh, I included a picture here of a, of a phone. This is the only phone that uh, an informal worker has, oh, oh, the only one that uh, the, the couple has. And uh, I think this also uh, just illustrates the, uh, just the difficulty for these workers, not only to sustain themselves economically, but also to meet the rising expenses as a result of the COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, for overall urban areas, for example, places like Jakarta, Bandung, Surabaya, we do see um, similar uh, informal sector jobs. And I'll be talking a bit about how the COVID-19 um, pandemic and the outbreak response has affected their livelihoods. Uh, for street vendors, we are, uh, we are seeing the closure of spaces and activities affecting their income, so less people uh, less people outside means that they have less consumers. This results in a drop of demand, and which also leads to the loss of income. And it's reported that they are losing; they were losing income by 70 to 80 percent. Although the caveat uh, for this is that vendors who sold basic commodities uh, fared better. Uh, one, one, I think one point that was raised up by by a work by by an informal worker I spoke to was that uh, there is a growing number of philanthropy um, initiatives as well as uh, government initiatives uh, that provide these basic commodities to to, um, to the uh, underprivileged population and this uh, actually helps these vendors to fare uh, throughout the pandemic crisis. For uh, online motorcycle taxi drivers, um, it is reported that they are experiencing a loss of income by 80%. Uh, 
I think one uh, major aspect was the prohibition from transporting people during this pandemic. Although consumer behavioral change also uh, contributed to the uh, decreased demand in their services, as, as, as mentioned before, this is also a health crisis and as, as a result, people do tend to uh, cook at home or, and avoid just contact with the, uh, with the outside world and this affects their income significantly. Um, and uh, I was speaking to a few drivers a few days ago, and uh, they were saying that even though uh, even though the transition is underway, uh, they are still experiencing a drop in demand. And uh, they hypothesized that this could also be because uh, people are changing their behavior in terms of transport. Uh, they don't they don't they no longer take an OJEC, but try to uh, walk or take public uh, take private, private transport. Um, as for the um, domestic workers, as mentioned earlier, uh, they can be found mostly in the urban areas and uh, many of them were dismissed without early notice uh, or severance pay. Um, worth noting as well is that uh, earlier, earlier this month, uh, Go Live, the Home Services Division of the Gojek app also closed down. So this division constitutes of the massage as well as the uh, home cleaning services. Uh, it is unknown how many uh, people are directly affected, but uh, it is a significant uh, proportion of the uh, domestic workers in urban areas. As for other parts of Java and Bali, uh, Chris mentioned earlier, uh, Yogyakarta, um, one of the major income source is uh, tourism, as well as Bali. So for uh, these parts of the country, uh, they are suffering because tourism is one of the hardest hit sectors, understandably so, due to travel as well as mobility restrictions. It is reported that an estimated of 300,000 informal workers are affected. Um, and we are hearing that they are, sh they are shifting to alternative income, for example, a trade, uh, trying to sell products and services online, or even farming. Uh, as for home workers, uh, they, they are spread across various industries. They are mostly women and largely invisible workforce. Uh, they, and they also possess, uh, according to surveys, a, a lower level of education compared to other informal workers. Um, according to one survey, over 50% of home workers no longer receive any orders uh, due to a drop of demand in, in the products. Um, many of these are handicrafts or textiles. Uh, fishermen uh, in, in, in places such as Sulawesi or Eastern Indonesian Islands, um, we are hearing reports that uh, prices have fallen by 50 to 75 percent for uh, seafood products. And I think this is also an example of how informal sector is an extension of the formal sector as processing businesses slowed down and other countries are on lockdown. Um, export companies and international trade uh, understandably decline and this affects um, how the fishers, uh, the fishermen uh, was unable to sell, sell their, their catch even though their catch remains uh, pretty consistent. Uh, we're also seeing hospitality businesses, uh, including those domestic ones, the domestic ones suffer as um, they are, you know, uh, the demand has dropped and also they were, they were closed during the past baby a past baby period. Um, and also uh, there are disruption in supply chain due to mobility uh, restrictions. Uh, other groups that are affected uh, are farmers in Eastern Indonesian islands. So actually 55% of the workforce in East Nusa Tenggara work in agriculture. Um, it, it has been overall a pretty, pretty uh, bad year for uh, the farmers. Production has fallen due to late and constant rainfall, but at the same time, demand for their products have also fallen due to mobility restrictions. It was difficult for them to um, uh, to transport these uh, these producers to the cities uh, because of the uh, social the large scale social restrictions. Uh, market prices have also fallen by fifty percent. Uh, so this this uh, this affects their earnings as a whole. 
uh, I, I won't go too much in the, into detail for the policy responses because I think Butitik had uh, as explained um, very comprehensively earlier and very well. I uh, just wanted to note that uh, the government has prepared a range of policy responses and uh, uh, and they are they are very they have been very helpful for informal workers. Uh, however, it is also worth noting that uh, informal workers are often mixed with the other beneficiaries um, in in the, these programs, and as such, not all informal workers uh, manage to benefit uh, from these policies. Uh, according to informal workers, uh, especially my research deals mostly with. Uh, online transport workers or online motorcycle taxi drivers, they found that the debt restructuring, especially for automotive, was particularly helpful uh, because a lot of them bought their motorcycles on credit and was actually hoping to pay it off as they get income from driving for platforms. Unfortunately, the pandemic uh, creates a difficulty for them to uh, reach that goal. However, the, um, the initiative from the government and OJK to restructure the loans uh, was very welcomed by these workers. Um, the government also introduced the cash for work program, which Mutiti explained earlier. Uh, this this has been, uh, I think, very welcome as well for informal workers who had to go back to their hometowns um, after not being able to earn any income in, in the urban areas. <clears throat> Uh, civil society and NGO have played a very significant role in providing support for informal workers, um, both in terms of economic support as well as ex uh, health support. Um, here on the right hand side, I included a screenshot from Kitabisa, which is a crowdfunding uh, website, uh, kitabisa.com, uh, in which uh, many organizations as well as civil society individuals uh, were crowdfunding to fundraise. Um, for, uh, for informal workers. Uh, this example here is an uh, initiative by uh, uh, the Urban Poor Network in Jakarta, uh, in which they, they fundraised uh, cash assistance uh, for informal workers and uh, the urban poor in their network. Uh, food aid uh, is also, uh, uh, is also provided by civil society NGO. Uh, I think one, one, one that stood out uh, for me was an organization called ACT Act, uh, who fundraised, uh, fundraised to distribute food for informal workers. They also partner with uh, a number of Wartuk across the different cities to distribute free food for informal workers in, in, in those Wartuk's neighborhoods. Um, there's also groups that help with advocacy for access to government schemes, uh, for example, a coalition um, that includes um, a Rujak, for example, um, gathering input from the workers and, and, um, and relaying these concerns to the government. We also see a number of different organizations um, distributing PPEs as well as sanitizers for free to informal workers, given that they are highly mobile and at, at uh, oftentimes they are at the front line. Uh, private sector also helped with fundraising on donation. Um, here we see that Tokopedia, Ovo, and Grab, they uh, jointly fundraised 2.5 uh, billion rupiah uh, by using their app uh, to encourage app users to donate um, electronically. Uh, we also see the emergence of new businesses which uh, provides uh, work opportunities for uh, informal workers who are no longer able to generate income from their original source of income. Um, there's also improvements in existing businesses to, uh, uh, to encourage uh, uh, consumption. For example, in tourism, we're seeing a lot of uh, hotels and hospitality businesses uh, setting up glass partitions, providing PPEs for their workers. And uh, as consumption in these areas increase, it will also trickle down to informal workers who depend on these industries for their livelihood. Um, online channels, we are also seeing a, a farm and sea to table, just uh, businesses, um, be, uh, businesses connecting, uh, connecting farmers and fishermen uh, to the markets by the use of online platforms. We also see pivoting of production. Um, a lot of the uh, designers and textile producers um, started producing PPEs, uh, masks, uh, cloth masks, for example, instead of 
um, the original like clothes and fashion items that they normally produce. Uh, mutual aid, uh, this is, uh, it's notable that informal workers are also supporting each other. Uh, earlier during the COVID uh, outbreak response, uh, we are seeing a lot of criticisms because uh, it, it seemed that civil society were supporting mostly uh, OJEC drivers because they are very mobile, very, they are very visible. And, um, the, and it was very encouraging to see even the drivers were, uh, uh, we're sharing, uh, you know, the food aid that they receive, for example, to other informal workers uh, around them. Uh, here uh, on the right hand side is also a hashtag Butu driver, which um, is being used by a number of uh, uh, of OJEC drivers who are more digital savvy, and we're able to um, support other informal businesses by um, by by. Uh, by, by sort of bypassing the, the online platforms and selling these uh, and promoting these businesses through, the, uh, through their use of the social media. Uh, however, uh, implications, as mentioned earlier, not all workers benefited from these policies. I uh, suppose it's worth noting that not all workers are categorized as poor, even though uh, their income, some of them, their income tended to hover above the poverty line before the pandemic, and as such, um, the loss of income during this time have the potential to make them fall into poverty. Um, I think Prakarja, uh, a comment about that is uh, during, the, during this time, most of the trainings were delivered online and as such, only informal workers who are digital savvy or have access to smartphones are able to benefit uh, from, from this policy. There's also an issue of the old database of beneficiaries as well as in, in, in accurate information. For example, um, their ID is not synchronized with their current address. Uh, a lot of the informal workers are migrant workers. They don't, they don't uh, own a house uh, in, in Jakarta or other urban areas. And as such, uh, they were experiencing difficulty in receiving uh, the social assistance. Um, there's also an issue of uh, debt restructuring and versus debt cancellation. The informal workers that I spoke to uh, express a preference for cancellation given that they do not know how long this pandemic will last and whether or not uh, they will have uh, the income to actually pay off the debt uh, they, they've generated uh, prior to the pandemic outbreak, even, even, um, even after the social restrictions have been lifted. There is also um, an express preference for cash-based support assistance to restart, given that many workers are uh, thinking of um, alternative sources of income rather than the, the ones that they are currently doing. Uh, so civil society and NGO, it was commented uh, by workers that uh, even though these efforts are very welcome, there's also still uneven distribution. Um, the suggestion here is that it requires a bottom-up approach in which workers can sort of self-declare okay. um, that they are uh, that they, they are uh, they, that they should be eligible for social assistance. Uh, for private sector, uh, there is also a continued need for assistance and training for low, middle, low income group. Earlier, we mentioned about the use of online channels that connects uh, farm to table and tea to table. Um, connecting the producers directly with consumers. However, um, it, it should also be noted that this uh, is significantly is more beneficial for workers who have access to smartphones or are more digital savvy. And I think this, this has the, the uh, potential to create further inequality between the digital haves and the digital have nots. Uh, for future direction, uh, there are two uh, recommendations, uh, for one for the short term, the other for long term. Uh, given that we don't know how long the, uh, the pandemic will last and how this will continue to affect the livelihoods of informal workers, um, the recommendation here is to, uh, to collect uh, accurate data of informal workers uh, within a region and use the information to design targeted support and redeployment into industries that are actually hiring. I think a big problem uh, with targeted support uh, as well as uh, informal workers being uh, lumped together with other beneficiaries of social assistance is that we don't we don't actually know 
who these workers are exactly. And as such, we are unable to design a targeted support for them. And I think this is one area that can be improved on then. Uh, one, one quick way to evaluate is by piloting uh, a database within a region. And finally, for long term, uh, the labor legislation uh, needs to be revised to recognize informal workers and to consider uh, the diversity of the sector as, uh, as well as the new forms of work, including platform work. Uh, lastly, also, we need the same labor and social protection standards to be extended to all workers, regardless of employment status. Uh, and that's all for me. Uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, uh, that's the first time I think we've had a comprehensive discussion of informal sector activities in relation to crisis. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, it's, it's a very mixed picture, isn't it? Uh, uh, some people being able to adjust, but uh, many having their incomes reduced, losing their jobs. Um, health risks are a major problem uh, that you mentioned. Uh, lack of bargaining power, and of course not being covered by the, by the labor legislation. Um, so there's, there's lots of lots of uh, lots of big issues there. Well, can we open this for discussion? Uh, and uh, there are a number of uh, Ahli uh, in the labour field in the audience. Uh, uh, so I'm wondering if I can ask a couple of them to to make some comments. Uh, perhaps if we could start with uh, Michelle, Professor Michelle Ford, uh, who's who's joined us, uh, and uh, then maybe with uh, Masario, who. Uh, of times uh, studies uh, uh, labour market issues. Michelle, could, could we uh, ask you to speak? Uh, sure, happy to. Um, so I think this is a really important topic, obviously, and I'm working with some colleagues on comparing responses to COVID in a few Southeast Asian countries. Um, and I think one of the things, I, all I can see is my own face, but anyway, um, one of the things that is really interesting about this is trying to work out how organised labour movements respond to the changes in the manufacturing sector. Uh, there were some very interesting statistics in the first paper about impact on manufacturing. Uh, but something that I think is particularly interesting is how international connections of the labour movement have influenced uh, trade union responses to COVID and then how they've tried to manage the loss of their, their key uh, strategies for engaging with both employers and governments, which is mass protest. Uh, so in terms of the former, just observing um, through Facebook communities and other forums how, how quickly some of the trade unions um, started talking about the dangers of COVID. In fact, well before the, unit, the um, government did, uh, urging their members to socially distance, to be careful and so on. And of course, at that stage, there's a big tension between their need to keep their jobs, but also a resentment that other people are being told to work at home or they're being told they must go to the factory. Uh, so that's, that's an interesting tension that I think also shows how the communication from the international labour movement affected that initial response. And then, of course, the second big point of observation in terms of the labour movement's role was negotiations around the omnibus law. And um, you might remember that there was a big threat by all three confederations to strike, um, to hold a big demonstration just after social distancing had become a real thing. And in fact, they used that threat very effectively to convince Jokowi to uh, sus you know, suspend negotiation of that part of the Omnibus Law for further consultation. Um, I found that particularly interesting because it, the, you, by using the threat of, of protest rather than actual protest, it was really moving out of its comfort zone, but I thought in a very strategic way. I think in the longer term, though, it will be interesting to see what the impact on manufacturing and on global production networks has on organised labour, but also on formal work more generally. Uh, uh, Mas Hario, could you follow up with a, with a question? Thanks uh, very much, uh, um, Michelle. Okay. Uh, uh, my question directed to all uh, first, and the second is for TT. Uh, for all strategies to prevent COVID and an economy, 
are based on the assumption that coronavirus do not spread airborne. With the new information that coronavirus spreads through airborne and increased workplace clusters, is the new strategy needed? Maybe first more stringent protocol and ensure compliance, which is very, very difficult. Because, for example, companies tend to hide COVID cases because of reputation uh, and, uh, and others. Yeah? Uh, should we have more testing, tracing, and isolation? Uh, and the second is maybe because of this phenomenon, uh, counterintuitively, counterintuitively we, we should focus on high value added sectors less labor-intensive sectors. Also focus on agriculture because agriculture is open space, not crowded, uh, but also include the supply chains of agriculture. And maybe we should also rethink about higher social assistance. Maybe the proposal of Pak Kati Basi, universal basic income, one million per person, maybe is now become uh, needed. Yeah. Uh, my second question is for Titi. We always hear the, po the bottlenecking. Question, Sorry? That's the third question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it's about the bottlenecking. What is the details and updates for that? Because we always hear the bottlenecking, the bottlenecking, but we, we never hear about the details and updates of that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I, I think uh, Michelle's question is probably more directed towards Joanna than to Titik, but maybe Titik ha has some response as well. Um, so over to you, Joanna. Um, uh, sorry, was the question about how trade it, 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 The first part, the first question was to do with international connections and the role of, of, of international trade unions and and uh, how they respond uh, to this very different uh, set of uh, political circumstances. Uh, and the second one, one was the omnibus, about the omnibus uh, 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 strike threat. Yeah. yeah, I think in my research, uh, I focus mostly on online motorcycle taxi drivers. Uh, they are, uh, there is an indication that uh, they have started to connect with international uh, unions or uh, overseas uh, and as well as the overseas unions reaching out to them. Uh, but I think it's important to note as well that these unions are uh, app-based uh, unions. So they are not the traditional uh, labor unions that uh, mostly, the, the, the traditional uh, labor unions. But I think uh, international network is very important because it could uh, give them lessons from what has been done overseas and also to sort of uniformize the um, uh, the responses uh, to the government and to also push for collective representation of informal sector workers. And, and, and do you have any response on, on where we are at now with Labour's position in regard to the omnibus law which, which they opposed very strongly initially? Yes, uh, so I've spoken to a few uh, informal workers, uh, especially uh, online transport workers. Uh, I think there's there's various studies that um, uh, not only in Indonesia, but also overseas uh, that argues that many of these online uh, or platform workers do not see themselves as uh, workers in a traditional sense. Uh, there is a strong narrative that they are own account workers or they are entrepreneurs. Um, some of the uh, figures in the industry that the online transport industry that I've spoken to actually are sort of on the fence about the omnibus law. Uh, they are not uh, joining the, uh, the traditional unions in uh, protesting against it because they want to wait and see uh, what's in it for them. Uh, they are under the impression that most of the regulations affect mostly formal sector jobs. And uh, for them, that is not really relevant to the conditions that they are uh, there in. Well, Titik, do you have a, a, a response to that, particularly on the omnibus law uh, and labor, uh, labor conditions, labor and the labor movement? 
Um, I think uh, the labor uh, union has the right to comment or to uh, protest on the uh, um, omnibus law, pa. It's just that we need to come into some kind of uh, balance between uh, the the overall objective of the omnibus law. I think uh, the the what is it? The discussion is still under. Uh, um, a, what is it a, is going I mean uh, the, the discussion is still uh, uh, going at the parliament discussing the part uh, the the omnibus law pa. Okay. yeah okay um, then uh, Mas Hario's questions on the airborne spread of uh, that we that we need a new strategy yeah I think uh, I agree with Mas Hario that a stringent protocol need to be imposed. Um, uh, I uh, at least Jakarta and uh, West Java uh, impose um, fine uh, to the to those who don't wear mask. So the issue is probably how uh, discipline the uh, uh, the the government to monitor and implement this uh, fine and also i think a part of the fine is the socialization so all the all um uh, i mean the relevant institutions or uh, stakeholders need to be uh, to be actively participate in this effort including the the unions i guess uh, as michelle already mentioned because the workers is some uh, the, the workers that spreading i mean we the who who, who works uh, that spread the 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 the, the, the virus uh, anyway so if we don't observe the 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 the, 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 the protocol we uh, impose a risk to others and to uh, ourselves and uh, on the second point of mas hario's comment is <clears throat> i think naturally we are going to move to higher value added uh, and less labor intensive sectors given the situation because anyway if you see if you see in the in the in the data that the uh, human capital intensive sectors are the, the one that that is growing while the uh, more uh, unskilled labor intensive is uh, negatively affected so but then uh, we need to um, uh, provide some cushion to those negatively affected by the 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 the, the, the COVID nineteen, while um, uh, while uh, facilitating the, the the sectors that can uh, uh, accelerate uh, during uh, this uh, time, uh, so that uh, we uh, can have a new engine of growth or something like that. And on the uh, on the, the bottlenecking, Masario, I uh, we 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 rarely discuss this um, uh, publicly, but of course, first uh, we have to find whether there is a bottleneck, and then uh, we uh, we uh, we map where the bottleneck is, and then uh, of course, uh, if it is uh, in particular institution, we talk with the particular institutions on how to. Um, um, to, to, to solve the problem. Even sometimes um, uh, we have to amend the, the decree, the regulation to, to get the things uh, moving. So, um, uh, so that's basically uh, the, 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 the bottlenecking mass scenario. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. But Joanna, do you have any, any, any quick response or not any of those questions? on? Uh uh, uh, yeah, perhaps I could uh, maybe add a comment on the suggestion to uh, shift to value added uh, value added goals. Uh, I think uh, with the kartu prakerja, there's uh, it was mentioned earlier that most of the uh, workers uh, choose to do courses on um, sales and marketing, which is very tied to entrepreneurship. I think from the workers that I've spoken to, at least the younger generation and the mo the ones who are digital savvy and are good with smartphones. There is a move towards entrepreneurship uh, because orders through the motorcycle taxi platforms is very low at the moment. They are using this time to explore entrepreneurship opportunities. And I think perhaps this is a trend uh, going forward that we can see informal workers uh, move towards. Okay, well, th thank you very much. Um, we're fast running out of time. Um, uh, there are a number, we still have a number of people uh, uh, who've raised their hands. 
one, one of them is Arian and another is Peter McCauley. I wonder if you could put your questions, uh, would you like to put your questions directly? And uh, if you could uh, make them brief. Arian, are you still there? I am. Um, sorry, I was unmuting myself. This is Arun Dutta from the Health Policy Plus Project. My question is on the informal sector voluntary segment that pays into the National Health Insurance Scheme. Anecdotally, we're hearing that there are a lot of uh, problems with um, these workers paying into their scheme in terms of membership uh, premiums, and hence they're losing their benefits at a time when health healthcare coverage would be quite important. Could any of the speakers, uh, maybe Octavia, could... Um, comment on this um, and what kind of statistics uh, are available um, and what would be the best response. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much for the question, Arun. Uh, perhaps for statistics, maybe I could get uh, get back to you separately after the presentation because I, I, I don't have it uh, off the top of my head. Uh, but uh, perhaps one thing that I could comment on the voluntary uh, contribution is that uh, because the informal workers do register and they pay voluntarily, uh, in times of crisis, uh, I think it is bound that this might not be a priority for them, given that they have to contribute to other uh, other things. Uh, whereas for formal sector workers, they have employee, uh, they have the employer contribution for it. So I think the the question is that that this raises is the the structure of the scheme uh, and who should be contributing um, to, to these schemes for informal workers, especially. Yeah, th thanks, thanks very much, Joanna. Um, Peter McCauley, could we uh, have your question? Yeah, thank you very much. One question to Boo Titik and one question to Boo Joanna. Uh, to Boo, Boo Titik, this is about the credit programs. There are many countries that have credit programs. And the, the credit programs are often not all that uh, so easy. My question, my questions to you are first, how does it work in Indonesia? Which banks will provide the credit? Is it the Bank Rakyat Indonesia, BNE, Mandiri, others? I mean, is it, is it a number of them? Is it 10 or 20 or a lot of them? And second, one of the problems that we run into then is if, if, if people, people, firms can borrow, but then, then they have credit risk and they might find they cannot repay. So who bears the credit risk? Uh, do the banks have to bear the credit risk? And if that's so, then the, the banks may not be happy with that. That's question one. Question two is to Bo Bo Joanna. Please keep you it brief, Pat. Yeah, you mentioned the importance of a database for informal workers. My question is, what do the workers themselves feel about a database? Sometimes informal workers like to remain hidden. Sometimes they don't want Pajabat and the Pamarinta to know what they are doing. So that's my second question. Terima kasih, yeah? Terima kasih. Perhaps Boutidik first and then Joanna. Thank you, pa, Peter. Uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, credit uh, will be channeled uh, through the uh, banking sectors, pa. so the banks will provide the credits. The government started with the uh, state-owned enterprise uh, uh, banks, uh, the uh, BRI, BNI, Mandiri, and so on, and then uh, continue to the private sector. So the, the thing is like this, the government uh, put the money, uh, put the funds into the banks, and the bank uh, channeled it to uh, uh, the MSMEs. And uh, uh, the, the government also provide the credit guarantee and this this funding is actually a uh, low cost part because it, it is it is um, uh, use the the uh, funds from the uh, bonds uh, bought by the central bank and the uh, the, the, the 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 risk who bore the risk uh, there is a uh, what we call it a credit guarantee scheme so the credit will be uh, guaranteed by uh, Askrindo Jamkrindo, the, the the insurance uh, uh, company. The 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 the, the government uh, share the risk with the with, with the banking sectors. I think I uh, hope that um, uh, in answer your question, Papira. Joanna, do you have anything to add? Please keep it very brief. We're almost out of time. Uh, sure. So, yes, uh, I think that's correct, uh, but Peter, that informal workers do tend not to want to be registered for various reasons, including taxation. Uh, but I think in times of crisis, they are 
sort of changing uh, their view on this. Uh, most of the ones that I've spoken to actually prefer having a database so that distribution for assistance is even and they get a they get assistance as well from the government. So yeah, I think the uh, their preferences change uh, with change in situation. Acho, can we go a few minutes over? We still have a, a number of questions. Sure, but, sure. We can. Uh, okay, great. Well, uh, could I invite uh, uh, Hal Hill and Budi Reso Sadama? Uh, both of them have put their hands up. Uh, and uh, and and a, th a third third question from uh, Krishna Gupta. So, so could you all keep them all very sh very short, if you please? Go ahead, uh, Hal Hill. Okay, uh, Trimma uh, uh Hi, everybody, and thanks for two excellent presentations. I enjoyed them both. Uh, Tudik, a question to you. Uh, hi, Salama Puggy, and hope you're well. Uh, Tudik, the question, I guess, is for a crisis like this, of such severity and hitting so suddenly, the uh, question is, for social assistance there's a sort of trade-off isn't there on the one hand you want to get the money out really quickly because the crisis is so severe and so quick on the other hand you want to target as much as you can to the people who really need it it, it just thinking about your excellent presentation it, it occurred to me i think you mentioned seven programs of social assistance question in my mind is is that actually in some ways too much? Uh, that is, you just got to get the money out quickly. And even though you might want to fine tune and target, it's just not practical in the very short run. And so you're going to make mistakes, you know, type one error, people who don't need it, get it. And type two, people who need it, don't get it. Just wondering wh what the trade off is and whether the government's going to fine tune uh, as the COVID continues beyond the first three or four months. And, and that might get the disbursement rate up a bit more quickly. Prima Kasi. Thank you very much. Uh, a good presentation. Uh, so my question is similar to how, given that uh, resource, Indonesian resources is limited, we know that uh, to fund our deficit right now, we are struggling. And also that the period of the COVID uh, is uncertain. I just wonder whether the strategy in, uh, yes, the program, the stimulus program are comprehensive, but the strategy, whether it is uh, appropriate. So a bit different than how, uh, I thought that uh, among those programs that has been relatively smooth are the social assistance. So just focus on the social assistance hold the uh, micro and small enterprise incentive until it is certain uh, whether or not uh, uh, the disbursement, disbursement can be effective and also that the impact will be effective because the micro and small enterprise has two uh, jobs that they have to do. One is that, yes, they're providing a social assistance to increase the resilience of micro and small enterprise, but second is that this incentive is supposed to be giving them a foundation to jumpstart the economy when the pandemic has been controlled. But the problem is that the, uh, the, we are not certain how long the pandemic is uh, ongoing. So if you disperse the money to the micro and small enterprise, they are not being able to create a foundation for the, as a jumpstart for the economy. So uh, what do you think that it is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Yeah. I know. And uh, finally, uh, with uh, uh, Krishna, are you there? Uh, but but I, I think I will just read Krishna's question because uh, he's not available to question to ask question. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, seems intriguing that since the government assistance program seems to target mostly formal, uh, for example, tax cuts. While COVID hurt services and manufacturing more, beneficiaries are mostly farmers. Bottom up targeting would need central government to trust local government while also provide them with cash. Uh, his question to Butiti, uh, are there ways for local governments to get their own funding without relying on central governments? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, all, all those questions are around issues of targeting. Um, and what is the most effective form of social assistance? And I think earlier there was uh, some discussion of universal 
uh, income or universal uh, subsidy. So uh, uh, I, can I hand it over to the two speakers? To uh, Joanna, would you like to go first and then Batitik uh, 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 round it off? Yeah, for informal sector workers, because they are heterogeneous and their situations are not uniform across the, uh, the board, uh, there is an express preference for uh, social assistance in the form of cash or rather than subsidies in other forms. Um, and also, uh, I think a majority of them that I've spoken to do prefer some sort of social assistance uh, as capital in the, in the, in the, uh, in the form of cash for restarting uh, because Many of them, for example, online motorcycle taxi drivers are beginning to realize that they cannot depend on um, orders from the apps because the, the demand is declining. Okay. But did Hello, hi. Yeah, thank you, pa Chris. Hello, Hal. Uh, very nice to meet you. I'm a proud student of Hal, by the way. Uh, thank you for the questions. I think uh, for the longer uh, term, I, uh, Okay, short and medium term is uh, tnp 2 k is evaluating all the all, all the assistance, um, and in the longer term, the, the database that we are using to uh, as a basis for our social assistance is also going to be updated comprehensively. That's a uh, vice president's instruction because uh, our, as you know, our data is um, uh, kind of updated and patchy. Uh, uh, updated. I mean, some some region updated the data, but some others are not. And also, I think related to Pa Budi's point is that we should uh, and uh, Krishna point that we should um, engage or I mean the the central government uh, in coordination in collaboration with the, uh, the local government is um, uh, disbursing this social assistance to reach uh, a better targeting. I think this has been done. I mean, of course, in the early period of the implementation of social assistance, we have a hiccup. But ever ever since the evolution, the the the, the management of the data, the uh, between the local, uh, central government and local government improve. I think the, 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 the targeting is uh, better than uh, April or May, for example. And um, Mas Budi's point, I think I agree with you. I think uh, 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 we have to have our uh, social um, assistance uh, in place, well covered, the, the vulnerable one, and the uh, private sectors, including the micro and uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, our jump start uh, when we are sure about the the, the, the COVID nineteen is uh, safe enough uh, for us to uh, open the economy. However, pa, as uh, I think Joanna mentioned that this uh, micro, for example, and uh, small uh, firms are also need to survive. I mean, uh, the social assistance is basic is a basic income, right? And uh, with the limited uh, opening up of the economy, they can work as well, yeah? So they have better income and so on. So I think the, the government is focusing on the micro and small uh, so that they, they can restart the, 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 the business uh, 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 with the new, um, uh, uh, what is it, COVID uh, uh, protocols. I hope I answer uh, your, your questions, Hal and Pabudi. Thank you. Uh, and also, uh, once again, on Krishna's point, um, because the, the, the local government has been reallocating their budget to address COVID-19 and the economy, the central government provide loans, zero cost loans to local governments. Uh, it started with the DKI Jakarta and West Java where the 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 uh, the, the loans is uh, uh, from the bonds issued and bought by uh, issued by the government bought by uh, central bank so it's zero cost basically to uh, allow the the local governments to uh, have more uh, rooms and uh, funds to uh, to manage the covid-19 and the uh, the economy uh, thank you pa Thank you very much, Baditik. I, I, that, that, that's a very, very comprehensive answer. Uh, and I'm sure you can uh, talk with your former supervisor uh, mm -hmm. uh, at, at great length on, on, on these issues. 
But, but I tell you, how's our time? Uh, we, we're, we're about 10 minutes over already now, I think. That's um, right, but There's a couple of more questions. Can I? Oh, I think we, our time is up. So, right. but, but we already copy all the written questions and we can share later with the speakers. Right. Yeah. Well, well, on behalf of everyone, uh, uh, can I thank the two speakers for, uh, for a very stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge topic and uh, uh, I think we, we, we've covered it pretty well and there, there are many questions still outstanding and many answers outstanding. But, uh, at, at least we've, uh, we've, we've covered a number of the, the important ones today. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Joanna. Thank you very much, Batiti. Uh, um, thank you, pa, Chris. Thank you for okay. uh, chairing the session. And also thanks, uh, uh, Titi, Joanna, and all the participants. Before I hand it over back to Nuka, let me uh, read the uh, the program. Uh, so we don't have one scheduled for next next week, but the week after that, which is uh, 12th of August, we have a special webinar with our colleagues from Prospera. So that would be on agenda matters in Indonesia's COVID-19 policy response. And the speakers are Melissa Wells and Bimbi Kabasnet from Prospera. And the discussions are Wita Krisanti from Investing in Women and uh, Ariana Utomo from the University of Melbourne. So back to you, Nuka. Okay, thank you, Acho. Um, I will not close the um, webinar yet. So if uh, Pak Hal and um, Titi and Doni, and I see, I see a lot of Hal students here, and then Mbak Uti and everyone and Puspa, if you would like to continue the discussion, please feel free to do so. I will leave this open, but for everyone else who would like to join in, please stay or otherwise, you know, Please feel free to leave. Thank you.